I think we're ready to go live and so we want to welcome you to the Kentucky Center for Mathematics. Um, this week we are focusing on fractions and we look forward to learning from uh, KCM Director Dee Cresticelli. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm allergic to Kentucky so I'm a little scratchy today so I'm going to apologize that up for that up front. Um, but here we go. So we've been focusing on fractions this week and today we're going to talk about fraction equivalents and what we're going to do is we're going to talk about that in the context of number lines. I am Dee Crescitelli and I'm very excited that you all are here today and um, there's my contact information should you want to get in touch with me. We're going to start with this activity called our fractions numbers and I lay this out as a as a concept as an, an idea that we actually need to talk about because I've been in rooms of adults who aren't necessarily convinced that fractions are numbers fractions are these things we're supposed to manipulate on paper to get answers um, I know a couple of people who have thought of them as a command to do something that they're not numbers right, they're their own special thing. Um, so I want you to take a minute to look through the uh, scenario there. Um, one student um, chose a number between one and 10 as three halves, and her friend Artie said, that's not a number, it's a fraction. Um, and his friend Kay is very much convinced that fractions are numbers, but Artie is not. And so there's a quiz to go with that. So take a second and look at that. Um, and then think about from a kid perspective, what you think some of your kids might have to say. And when you are ready, unmute or type in the chat box. I agree with Kay, um, and so all of those answers would be yes, because fractions are numbers, but if the kid doesn't understand that fractions are numbers, then he would probably answer no for those because he wouldn't understand that you could put them on a number line or that you could um, add them and make whole numbers and things like that. I see in the chat box as well that someone has typed in that lots of folks might think that the answer to number four is no. What do you guys think about that? Is it possible for a fraction to equal a whole number? What might be some misconceptions about that? Well, I know it's very common for students not to understand like a number over a number is one. You know, five over five, four over four. To me, that's where number four plays in, much less than going to like multiples like eight over four and things like that. You know, that's just taking it that much further. Yes, um, and I sat in a room with a grown adult woman who really thought that mixed numbers were a whole number paired with one of these little fraction numbers that, you know, you put together to make a mixed number that all the fractions lived between zero and one. So she said no for a fraction to equal a whole number because all the fractions live between zero and one. And then you just start adding them together with whole numbers to get the mixed numbers. I know with a lot of my students, they think of a fraction being part of a whole. So they don't think about it being that it can't equal a whole number. And a couple of you actually just put that in the chat box as you were as you were talking. Um, there, that it's not ever, it can never be more than one, more than a whole, right? That fractions live between all the whole numbers across the whole number line. So that is precisely why this number line work is really important. Um, our research for this today is based um, on the IES practice guide. Um, if you were here yesterday, Cindy walked you through um, the, an overview of this. Um, it's really good fraction instruction information for kindergarten through eighth grade. And she walked you through um, the review of 
the recommendations really quickly to sort of telescope out what this week was going to look like. Today we're going to live solidly in the second recommendation from that report. The idea is that we have to help students recognize that fractions are numbers and that they expand the number system beyond the whole numbers. Um, use number lines as a central representational tool in teaching this and other fraction concepts from the early grades onward. And we're going to walk through some of those uh, components underneath there over the course of the rest of this session. I feel so strongly about this particular recommendation from that guide that all of recommendation two is in your handouts as the first thing. Uh, number line work is just pivotal, pivotal, pivotal to basically understanding number, whatever those numbers are um, and understanding the number system. Okay, it's really good. So number line work actually starts with foundations and whole number. Um, and I would say if you've not done a lot of number line work with students, fractions are not the place to start that. Um, they actually have to build a concept of what numbers look like on a number line with whole numbers. So I'm point to um, in Kentucky a second grade measurement and uh, data standard actually um, because it's relating addition and subtraction to length. So thinking of number line work as uh, the geometry of the space, right, that we have equally spaced points out and sort of just getting a sense of that scale is really important um, before we start trying to build the fraction work on top of that. Um, but having an idea of how a number line works is really important to this work. So I want to look at these through a standards lens. And so in Kentucky, um, the first number line standard that has to do with fractions um, is Kentucky 3 NF2. Um, and it's about, it literally says, understand a fraction as a number on a number line. It's st stated pretty clearly in the standard. Um, and then represent fractions on a number line. This standard is, is divided into two parts. So A is represent a fraction one fourth. I'm using that as an example because reading it algebraically is just really cumbersome. So representing a fraction one fourth, a unit fraction on a number line, by defining the interval from zero to one as the whole, and then partitioning it into four equal parts, right? So we recognize then that each part has a size of one fourth. And if you were here yesterday, we talked a lot in Cindy's session about the size of the fraction is the way we needed to look about it. And then a unit fraction, one fourth, is located one fourth of a whole unit on the number line. It's really important that kids have an understanding what units are um, because it's, we're going to keep coming back to that in all of the fraction work this week. So understanding that the length of one on the number line is our unit and then the fractions become subunits from there. So here's what that looks like. So we partition a number line. In this case, we're talking about thirds into three equal parts. Each one of those intervals, right, becomes an interval of one third. And one third is a point that has a name on the number line. It's a lot built into that. Second part of the standard, represent a non-unit fraction, we're going to say three-fourths on a number line, by marking off three lengths of one-fourth unit fractions from zero. So then our resulting interval has a size of three-fourths, and that endpoint locates the non-unit fraction three-fourths on the number line. So again, I iterate one third to build two thirds and then three thirds and then four thirds and then five thirds and then six thirds. I can also go, be, go back and rename three thirds and six thirds as one and two. Okay. A couple people have put in the chat box about the connection between the bar numbers 
uh, the bar models and the number lines, and we're going to come back to that. That is pretty important um, to build this up. We go from linear to number line, um, sort of in tandem. Um, it makes it make a whole lot more sense to kids. And then we have four lengths of one third starting from zero. Okay, pretty important for kids understanding that fractions can live beyond one, uh, beyond one, right? So I've got four of those lengths of one third, which then gives me an interval of four thirds. Okay. Kelly reminds me that this link, this links back to my skip counting session from last week. I can count with fractions. Cindy had us count with fractions if you were in the session yesterday. Um, but this sort of links into the skip counting. Um, counting is really important, right? And so interconnected. So, yes, Finda, counting by knowing the size of your units. What am I paying attention to, right? So again, four thirds can be an interval but it also can, is the name of the point on the number line. So lots of this terminology lives in a resource that's available on our website. We just call it LMR, which is the shortcut for learning mathematics through representations. It's really good material for making that length um, transition from a linear model to number line work. It does that with um, Cuisinair rods and number lines. And there are subunits about positive integers, negative integers, and fractions. So it's really good for developing a sense of number and number line work for both whole numbers and fractions and then integers. So it's really good for third grade through sixth grade um, in the state of Kentucky. That is available on our website. Um, and the picture of what that website looks like is a direct link to, a link to that page on our website. Um, and so you can uh, click through and it'll take you right there. Um, as you can see, there are positive integer lessons, negative integer lessons, and our fraction. Um, it's a full unit that does some really good work there. We're gonna pull a couple of examples from this um, as we finish our session today. Um, and the whole units are available to be downloaded. So here is one example of a worksheet from that uh, unit. What I love about this is it connects that area work that Cindy did yesterday at looking at the size of pieces. Uh, to a number line model. So two different models, two different representations of fractional amounts. Um, I want you to take a second and do some noticing and wondering and then either type in the chat box or unmute and let me know what are some things you notice or you wonder about this particular activity. Um, I noticed that um, the shaded area is not partitioned like the rest of the pie. So the shading does not, that shaded area is, is lots of kids would say it's missing a line, right? Why would you think that that might be done on a activity for kids to do? I think it would force them to reason about the shading as well as the partitioning. Yeah, I think it also forces them to uh, really think about equal sizes, equal equal shaded parts or equal parts, and uh, and in order to have that shaded part uh, be equal to the other the non shaded parts, it's more than one part. You just can't. It's two parts. So we're reasoning about the size of the piece, right? As opposed to either where uh, tick marks are or where, part, you know, where lines have been drawn, right? What we're paying attention to, if I ask you about the shaded amount, that's what, you know, we're supposed to be paying attention to. Um, and that circle could be partitioned in multiple ways. 
Yeah, I think, can I add something? I feel like sure. a lot of times fractions, we make them counting activities. It's not, yes. it's not about fractions. And so this, this gets it beyond, I'm just counting. So. Um, and I agree with you. There are far too many fraction uh, worksheets and even fraction activities that actually don't involve any fraction understanding. They really are just counting. Um, and that is not productive fraction work, right? Kindergartners can count. They don't necessarily have an understanding of what that looks like thinking about fractional parts of a number or it really gets a lot harder to think about fractions greater than one when it's a counting thing. In this next slide, we're gonna look at some student work from that activity. So what's the first thing you notice that the student did? The student tried all three possibilities. So the student really did go through and look at here's what here's what all three of these number lines look look like, right, before they chose what they did. Cindy put in the chat, draw the line in the shape to make equal sized parts, right? So lots of kids are going to need to make them all equal sized parts, and that makes perfect sense, right, to do that because we if we taught them to think about the things need to be the same size. Um, but they got, the comparison, they, right? they got the right answer, but they but their models don't show their understanding of what they did. So like B goes, well, they think it's one six, but that's not that model. B is not divided into six. It's, it's divided into fifths. Right, I'm on my phone, so hopefully I'm right. And right, so, they don't have fractions underneath it, so we might not have enough information to know that. They just knew that it that doesn't match, so we are missing some information, right, to know um, whether they caught that that was fifth or sixth, right? Um, Elizabeth types in the chat box that uh, she wants to ask the student why they eliminated B. So what were they thinking about that? Yeah, which gets into that we don't necessarily have enough information. Um, yeah, and Cindy says she thinks the one six is labeling the space in the line above. Yeah, so we don't have any labeling in B to necessarily know, right? Yeah. Anything else? I noticed that sometimes they were labeling the space and then sometimes they were labeling the tick mark, um, which was interesting because when they got down to the bottom, I think like on A, that one sixth was kind of not in, it doesn't follow the pattern they were using for A, doesn't line up with the tick mark, but B, they labeled the spaces as one sixth and two sixths. Or C, you mean C? Oh yes, C, sorry, yeah. yes. That's okay, yeah. Um, and so they've had a conversation um, in this about both, like we just did a minute ago, about the, the interval has a name and then the point also has a name. And so each one of those spaces is a six, right? So that may be some understanding we can ask some more questions about. Elizabeth's got all sorts of questions she wants to ask. Uh, labeling the whole number line going from zero to one, right? Um, and it may be that she's been asked to go back to what the unit was, right? Um, and then Elizabeth talks about wondering what the student would do if the problem was greater than one. Um, and one of the things is this, is this is from the very first lesson in that unit. So we don't go over one to start. Um, and so this student's going to have some time to build up the understanding of what it might mean to go greater than one, right? I wonder if they had put the arrow on the second tick mark on every one of them, uh, what they would have done. Right, because that would be a little tricky for a first first pass with this, right? Yeah, but it's my wondering, like what what would happen for the next step? I would want to I would want to see what their understanding. What that not. would happen. Nope, and that would be good to, to sort of spend some time seeing what that might happen. Awesome, thank you all. 
So we have lots of fraction standards for third grade. It's a pretty important part of that grade. And so additional standard that goes with equivalence of fractions is comparing by reasoning about their size. That size is just a magic word for fractions in third grade in particular. So we're meant to understand two fractions as equivalent or equal if they're the same size or the same point on a number line. Recognize and generate simple equivalent fractions. Explain why the fractions are equivalent through writing or drawing. And then express whole numbers as fractions. We name that out loud, right? And recognize fractions that are equivalent to whole numbers. We're gonna lean a little bit into a fourth grade standard about extending understanding of fraction equivalence and ordering. Um, we're gonna use visual fraction models to recognize and generate those, understand that they can have different numerators and denominators, even though they are the same size. Again, we go back to size. And then we're gonna explain why um, a fraction is equivalent to another fraction because we can do the multiply across the top. I can multiply that fraction you know, a, the, the, you know, the algebra piece of that, um, do that multiplication, but we start with that visually, okay? As you're gonna see over the course of this, we are not doing any computation at all. So we start with equivalent fractions on a number line. And so I've partitioned off between one, my number line goes on to two so that you can see that. What did I do here? What did I add to my number line? He subdivided each section or each of the fourths so that now our total, um, we've got twelfths. So I started off with one fourths and then I added further divisions, further partitions, right? And I ended up with twelfths. Okay. Buna says I changed the unit size to twelfths, right? So how did that rename my point, which had been three fourths? What is the name of that fraction if I'm talking about using my unit size to be twelfths? My subunit is now twelfths. What does three fourths become? Nine twelfths. Lots of you typing that in the chat box. So nine twelfths. Okay. Did I need to do any calculation really to do that? Was I multiplying the top of the fraction and the bottom of the fraction by the same? No, I wasn't. Okay. It starts to lean into why fraction operations make sense. Right, it wasn't a numerical computation. It was an understanding that the fraction gets renamed because I'm naming the section that I'm talking about. The length of the space was, you know, partitioned in a way that I have 12 units to go from zero to one. And so that point is nine twelfths of the way. It's nine twelfths from zero, right? Or it's three twelfths from 12 twelfths. And so it's nine twelfths. Okay. Kids need lots of experience with seeing fractions on number lines, with building number lines, with putting those partitions in themselves, okay, so that they can see that, um, and so they can see that the different names that we have for fractions um, that are equivalent basically come from this kind of image, that it's about the unit we start with, the subunits, and then if I do any further sub, you know, any further partitioning, right? And Fund just typed in the chat box that paper folding is also very good, for, and it is, because you can fold a paper into halves and then fourths and then to twelfths, and then you can see that, right? Okay, and then fraction bars too, you can see that in those as well. Okay, any questions about this particular number line? Um, another um, activity from that LMR um, asks for specifically four equivalents. And so they're looking at other names for one fifth 
and the whole sheet is about one fifth, but there's lots of different ways that I can rename one fifth. And there's the student work for this. One of the things that I like about this is the student labeled everything. They didn't need to label everything to come, but they really needed to label everything um, to do that. Um, and so the partitioning helps me know what the names of the fractions are, right? How many subunits there are between zero and one, right? Um, but then this, the students get to add tick marks as they need them. There's some really good prompts and open-ended things, both in this uh, resource. It's really good for that. The big idea from lots of this is that equivalence is effectively renaming. I've used that word a few times over the course of the last 10 minutes. So students who've been composing and decomposing whole numbers and seeing the different ways of renaming specific quantities have an easier sense of equivalence as renaming if we've spent some time with that with whole numbers. So 27 can be lots of different things, right? I can decompose 27 lots of different ways. I can look at a number line and see different ways of renaming, right? If kids have lots of experience of seeing one fourth and two eighths together, seeing that the, the names come from those subunits, then it's easier to see two fourths, one half, one half and four eighths. Um, and it's really much easier to see four fourths and one and eight eighths as equivalent as well. And kids these experiences seeing these as not weird ways of writing numbers of, these are just different ways that I can name a quantity. But also true for fractions, right? And this is where I lean a little bit into the um, operations making sense. Um, part of that is lots of the fraction operations really do start with a sense of equivalence. That three-fourths is one-fourth plus one-fourth, one-fourth plus one-fourth. Um, I can also write that as three of these one-fourth things, three times one-fourth. Funa typed in the chat box that's something that just yells at my heart. Um, once you develop a strong understanding of equivalence, there's not really a need to teach any method meth method for addition and subtraction, kids easily see needs for creating same size units. It goes back to Cindy's slide from yesterday. Um, if you're here for those, you know, two, two bears plus five bears, two tenths plus five tenths, once we figure out what our units are, it's really, really easy, right? Really, really easy to do that addition and subtraction work. It also connects to multiplication because kids learn to work with multi-units. Um, and again, this ties back to my skip counting. Um, we ask kids to think about seven times six by skip counting um, hops of six or seven on a number line, depending on the context, area race, and seven rows of six, um, compartmentalizing that into five groups of six and two more groups of six, right? And these are the same kind of questions and same ways we need to be asking kids to think about fractions, numbers built out of subunits. Okay, we do all this work teaching kids to compose and decompose whole number. We need to give them the time and space to do those same things for fractions because they're numbers. And that's what that looks like again on a number line that thinking about subunits and working across that way um, is a much cleaner way to do this than thinking about this as procedural work really is composing and decomposing and being able to show that visually on a number line. So um, a couple of you asked before we got started about, yes, can you guys all see my Jamboard? Yes, someone give me a cue. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So um, I just realized that it is 2.30 and I have now gone, I'm gonna go over time, um, but I really want to show you these. Um, so there, there are three jam boards that um, my friend Cindy and I have built for you um, where you can have kids place the number lines where you 
want them. We started with a whole number one. Um, so I'm going to have you guys just help me place 72. Where do you think 72 should go? Am I close? No. <laughs> no, right? So how about now? Maybe a little more. Yeah. Like there. So one of the things you can do if you're working with kids virtually is you can have them help you place it start off someplace crazy and see what they do and then work, but have kids help you place it. Then you can keep going. This one is set so that you can scroll down to check your work, right? And so we didn't go over quite far enough, right? So there we are. Start with whole number if you've not done a lot of uh, work with kids on number lines. Um, there's one that does fractions. It's three fourths, one eighth, and one half. Again, we're living between zero and one. Okay. And then there's also the reveal that's there. We're going to spend a second with the last one on here. Mm -hmm. So here's where these go, right? So I can place, I'm going between zero and three, right? So what would you want to place first? I want to place one and a half. You want to place one and a half. Mm -hmm. and somebody typed in the three halves and somebody placed one, right? So right off the bat, we have different things that we would want to place, right? So um, people who said one and a half or three halves typed in the chat box about midpoint, right? So is that about my midpoint? Well, that works. A little more what? Right, left. I think, yeah, a little, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a little more to the right. A little more to the right still? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay. So now I've got my midpoint set, then it would be easier to replace these other things, correct? Mm-hmm. Well, three halves what is the same as kid... one and a half. Say that one more time. I said three halves is the same as one and a half. Oh, three halves is the same. So I could put that there. Um, it is really important for kids to see that the points on a number line can have lots of names. When you have a class number line, you can have strings going down the you know down from a point with all the different ways that you have renamed a number over the course of an academic year um, i think it's really important to do that was somebody going to say something i thought i heard somebody on mic oh i did i was thinking i'm on my phone so okay. yeah the, the one half and the two halves are now somewhat easy to place because they should be about equal distance from the two numbers that we have, right? Because two halves is almost one. So it's a half of a way, it's a half away from one and a half, and one half is a half away from zero. So, does that make sense? So they should does. be, so where we place them should be an equal distance from uh, the zero the, to one and a half. Yeah. So approximating that, because it's a little harder to get them exactly right. Uh -huh. Right, so we like our work. What's confusing at first is one half is not the midpoint, right? You have to look at what your scale is, what you're working with, right? So our scale was zero to three on this, right? So this is not the one you start with, okay? Questions, and again, we've got our Check. Look, we were pretty good. Oh, look, we were not quite so great here. Okay. Questions about that? I don't know. I just love the, what is it called? The jam? The jam, jam board. Yeah, I'm going to have to get on and learn how to do that. I just, it, it, this is worth the whole, I mean, yesterday's too, um, when she talked about it, it was like, that's a, a great thing for virtual learning. So um, love it. So thank y'all for sharing. 
Um, free in any of your Google Suites, Google Drive. Um, it's it's lovely. We we are we are getting super used to doing that, and it is pretty cool that you can set it up so that you can put the answer key below and make it so they can check their own work. Yeah, we are loving that feature as well. So that is the digital version of a of um, a number line because several people have been asking about those. Um, in your handouts, we've got some things that come from our Kentucky Numeracy Project, the Intervention Guide. And so there are various levels of what we call flippable number lines um, that really what you need is this printed out and paper clips. Um, it's pretty, pretty cheap activity to do, um, but it has the kids place and then they flip them over to do that same self checking. Um, that we did on the Jamboard. Um, I've given you some stuff with both whole number, it starts with the whole number, and then it goes through various levels of uh, fraction work um, that get up through that fourth grade standard. We lean into that fourth grade standard that I showed um, you guys um, just a little bit ago, um, but all of it number line based. And so there's lots and lots there, so. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. This week coming up, the rest of it, we're gonna lean into fraction operations um, and about all the different ways that those should make sense. They come from visual models to start with. Um, and so we should teach them uh, conceptually. And we've got three sessions for the rest of the week that will do all of that work. Um, as always, here's our website where you can find all sorts of things for teaching mathematics, K through eight. Um, we've got some more sessions coming next week on geometry and then the week after that we're going to talk about some more multiplicative thinking because when we were last together talking about that you gave us things to think about and add to those sessions. And as always we are here to support you and that's me. Thank you so much for coming today. See your use of the number line really uh, highlights just how important that visual concept is. So I see that Jennifer's giving you, do you see a little clap there? We're getting quite fancy with our uh, Zoom. So uh, we always love to give uh, Dee some feedback. If you would unmute your mic and talk to her about a couple of the things that were particularly noteworthy in this afternoon's presentation. Yeah, for me again, it's the learning how to work with kids in a different way like you know a lot of these activities i know i've done similar things you know person with with the kids there but to actually have something that i can do that i could actually see easily well i actually help teachers but help teachers to to do online learning at home and make it still innovative and creative and even if we're going back to school you know, things like, well, uh, they're talking about, you know, like the desk being apart. And, you know, that's a different way to teach, you know, where we're used to getting them in groups and letting them to work together. So how do we still have that interaction without so much, you know, uh, being right next to each other. And I think uh, that that some of the stuff you all shared today are, are good examples of things that we could do. So thank you. Thank you. We're actually trying to think about that model. Like we know what we're working with now in some places and what we're going to be looking at going into the fall. And so we're trying to find a good hybrid mix of things that kids can touch, but also some things for when, when we're not able to do that. And I think one of the things that's the, always the message from the Kentucky Center for Mathematics is that we think that slowing down and really having kids have the opportunity to think about what is equivalence and doing it on the number line and, and what did we just do? Those rich conversations really pay off in the long run as kids begin to develop that conceptual understanding as uh, Funda said, if they really understand equivalence, then adding and subtracting are a piece of cake for students. And so that's, that's the key there. Um, that's the key there. From the Kentucky Center for Mathematics, we thank you for joining us. Um, tomorrow we continue our focus on uh, fractions series and we're so glad that um, you took time to join us today. See you guys. Thanks everyone.